Hello, and welcome to Stanford CARE's monthly community health talk series. My name is Dr. Malathi Srinivasan. I'm a clinical professor at Stanford at the medical school in uh, internal medicine and associate program director, uh, excuse me, associate director for the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and Education and program director for the CARE Scholars and Team Science Fellowship. I'll be your moderator today. I'm very pleased to bring you this series of talks co-sponsored by Stanford Care, the Stanford Health Library, and the Vincent V.C. Wu Memorial Foundation. This is the first talk in our series for this year, and I'm so pleased to welcome Dr. Adrian Matthias Bakong, who will speak to us today on cardiometabolic disease among Asian people, prevalence, prediction, and precision medicine. Now, this you may think this is a mouthful, and it is, but he's going to enlighten us on quite a few things today surrounding cardiovascular health and your risk for heart disease. Now, cardiometabolic diseases comprise a leading cause of death amongst Asian peoples. New efforts have been initiated to better understand the differential risk profiles for each of the major Asian groups. Now, in this talk, we will understand the epidemiology and burden of cardiometabolic disease among Asian groups. We'll delve into the specific clinical, behavioral, demographic, and socioeconomic factors that contribute to this differential risk and discuss new developments to predict your risk for cardiometabolic disease in different Asian groups. Now, Dr. Bakong <clears throat> is a good friend and colleague. He's a postdoctoral research scholar here within the Stanford University School of Medicine in the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine. He's also the inaugural postdoctoral scholar with the Center for Asian Health Research and Education. He graduated with his PhD in Community Sciences from the UCLA Fielding School of Public Health in 2022 and received his MPH in Health Promotions and Behavioral Sciences from San Diego State University Public Health in 2016. He's also a current T32 postdoctoral scholar in the Division of Epidemiology at Stanford and is a postdoctoral affiliate of the Center for Innovation and Global Health. Now, on top of all of this, he's also the recipient of multiple grants, including a data science grant from the American Heart Association and a postdoctoral research fellowship also through the American Heart Association. His current projects evaluate the utility of racial correlation factors in cardiovascular risk algorithms, such as pooled uh, cohort equations, as well as health disparities among single race and multiracial Asian and Pacific Islander groups. His work has been published in leading journals, such as the Journal of Epidemiology and Community Health, the Journal of Health and Social Behavior, and Social Science and Medicine Population Health. Please join me in a wonderful warm round of applause for Dr. Adrian Bakong. Please also remember to put your questions into chat. We have your questions from uh, the people who have previously submitted, and we'll be going through as many of these as time permits. So again, please join me in welcoming Dr. Adrian Bakong. Thank you Bacong. so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasan. So let me go ahead and share my screen. So again, thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasan, for the kind words and the kind introduction. Again, as she mentioned, my name is Dr. Adrian Mutchis Bakong, and I'm a current postdoctoral scholar at the Stanford Center for Asian Health Research and Education, as well as the Division of Cardiovascular Medicine at the Stanford University School of Medicine. Thank you all again for attending my talk titled, Cardiometabolic Disease Among Asian People, Prevalence, Prediction, and Precision Medicine. I first like to acknowledge that my work has been funded by the National Institute on Minority Health and Health Disparities, the American Heart Association, as well as the Stanford University School of Medicine. Um, please know that the research presented tonight does not necessarily represent the views of the National Institutes of Health, the American Heart Association, or the Stanford University School of Medicine. So before I dive into the topic for tonight, I'd like to share my academic journey with you. I graduated with my bachelor's degree in physiological science at UCLA, where in addition to focusing on health and health disparities, I was highly involved in outreach programs to serve underserved and underrepresented youth in order to get them to try um, to attend college. And because of this community work, I became highly involved in looking at the intersections of community work with respect to health. That ultimately led me to get my master's degree in health promotion behavioral science from the San Diego State University School of Public Health. It was here that I became involved in community-based participatory research, particularly among the Pacific Honor community. It was also here that I grew in my love for the 
aspects of data disaggregation and thinking about how different racial and ethnic groups experience health differently. And more importantly, trying to understand what are those possible social factors that could underlie differences in health by race and ethnicity. That ultimately led me to my PhD in community health sciences from the Fielding School of Public Health, where I was particularly focused on examining how social factors and structural factors ultimately underlie health disparities among marginalized groups. It was also here at UCLA that I was particularly involved in examining the role and the intersection of immigration with structural racism on health. In particular, I was involved in the Health of Philippine Immigrant Study, which sought to really understand this question about acculturation. Are people in the, who come here to the United States, do they experience health differently as compared to people who stay in their home countries? In addition to that, I also published um, pieces of work focused on looking at immigration as a structural factor and how does it lead to differences in health by race group. Ultimately, my love and my passion for Asian and Pacific Islander health led me to the Stanford University School of Medicine and the Center for Asian Health Research and Education to ultimately understand health disparities and how to better address health for Asian Pacific Islander communities. And with that, let's go ahead and to dive into tonight's objectives. So for tonight, I hope to leave you with four key things to take away. First, I hope that we can understand a little bit more about the nuances in the epidemiology and burden of cardiometabolic disease among Asian groups. And what do I mean by cardiometabolic disease? In this case, I refer to a group of related diseases such as heart attack, stroke, and diabetes that ultimately work together in order to lead to health disparities among different groups. In addition to that, I hope we can dive a little bit into the role of specific clinical, behavioral, demographic, and socioeconomic factors that contribute to differences in cardiometabolic metabolic risk among different Asian groups. Third, I hope that to discuss some new developments um, in the field to predict cardiometabolic disease risk, particularly among Asian groups. And finally, I hope to leave you with three action items to think about how can we together improve the health of Asian populations. So let's dive in into talking about cardiometabolic disease. So as of the 2020 census, there are approximately 24 million people who identified as Asian. That's about 7.2% of the population. This population of Asian individuals is up 39% from 17.3 million in 2010. Of these 24 million individuals who identify as Asian, 19.9 million of these individuals identify as just Asian only, and 4.1 million people identify as Asian in combination with another race. You could see here on this chart of the United States that the concentration of Asian individuals is mostly held to the West Coast of the United States. There is a small pocket of Asian individuals in the East Coast of the United States, particularly in New York and New Jersey, which may be um, attributed to people who are living in New York. Now, as you may know, diabetes um, is higher among Asian groups as compared to other race and ethnic groups. These are data from the 1999 to 2018 National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey. And if you look at the prevalence of diagnosed diabetes, otherwise diabetes that was diagnosed by a doctor, we can see that it's 13.7% nationally among Asian groups. That's higher as compared to the Hispanic individuals, non-Hispanic Black, and non-Hispanic white people. However, when we look at undiagnosed diabetes, which in this case is diabetes based on hemoglobin A1C values that wasn't reported um, by a doctor, we see that it's actually fairly similar compared to other race and ethnic groups. But overall, if we take into account the amount of diagnosed diabetes from a doctor, undiagnosed diabetes that people learn through their hemoglobin A1C levels, we see that it's about 19%, again, higher as compared to other race and ethnic groups. Now, this wouldn't be a talk about Asian American health unless I discuss the heterogeneity that exists within the Asian American population. Specifically among Filipino groups, Filipino groups experience a higher prevalence of diabetes as compared to other um, Asian ethnic groups. However, we can see that it's actually lower among some Asian um, ethnic groups, and particularly Korean, about 4.7% of all Korean individuals experience diabetes. This heterogeneity also expands into heart disease, in particular, ischemic heart disease. Now, overall, from 2003 to 2017, the rate of mortality due to heart disease has been generally decreasing across all age groups, as you can see in this dotted black line for both men on the left and women on the right. However, there's a 
large differences in terms of the changes in heart disease over time with particular groups. I want to specifically highlight the groups in blue and groups in green, which represent Filipino Americans and Asian Indian people, respectively. You can see that in general for men, that these rates are declining very slightly. However, it's still higher relative to the general Asian population. And very concerning is that as we think about 2003 to 2017, we noticed that there's actually an increase in ischemic heart disease mortality in the Asian Indian men. Now for Asian Indian and Filipino women, we can see that there's a general decrease as well for Asian Indian women. But again, that slight increase that we see for Asian Indian women from 2010 on. Now this heterogeneity, what we see with respect to um, cardiovascular disease mortality also extends to looking at the confluence of diabetes and cardiovascular disease among, groups, among these groups. In particular, if we take a look at diabetes-related mortality with, for cardiovascular disease, we can see that the age-adjusted mortality rate is about 14.6 per 100,000 people. In other words, about 14.6 women die of heart disease related to, cardio related to diabetes um, among women and 22.9 among men. Now, if we compare that to other race and ethnic groups, it's actually lower. Uh, we can see that it's very high among Black women and Black men, and lower among non-Hispanic white women and non-Hispanic white men. But when we really disaggregate that age, when we look in particular for um, certain race and ethnic groups, we see that particularly among Filipino people, it's especially higher. It's about 19.9 per 100,000 people for women, and 37.8 per 100,000 people for women. We can see that these rates are generally comparable to the Hispanic population of women and actually higher than the Hispanic population. More importantly, if we think about proportional mortality, which is a measure of um, how much mortality is due to a cause of death relative to all mortality, we can see that's particularly high among Filipino um, people, about 5% for women and 6.1% for men. In contrast, if you look at Japanese individuals who have a lower um, mortality related to diabetes and cardiovascular disease, we can see it's um, 2.8% for women and 4.8% for men. So in general, what I really want to talk about is we have a lot of um, nationally representative studies through our national data sets, in addition to vital statistics, that ultimately try to track the epidemiology of um, Asian individuals around the United States. However, we also need to be conscious that there actually have been efforts in the past 10 years to oversample Asian individuals. Despite this, we have some questions that we want to consider as well. First, how robust are these estimates among Asian people across our national surveys? Are they going to say the same thing? Will they look the same across our national surveys? And second, given that the population of Asian individuals is changing, what are some new disparity groups that we should consider with respect to cardiometabolic risk? So i first like to share with you one of my um, current studies looking at these the robustness and reliability of cardiometabolic diseases across our different race groups. Now, as I mentioned, we have three national um, surveys which we use in order to better track the health of individuals across the United States. We have the NHANES, which is the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, the NHIS, which is the National Health and Nutrition Survey, and the BREFIS, which is the Behavioral Risk Factor Surveillance System. Each of these data sets are intended to track the health of individuals across the United States. However, this might seem a little excessive, but there are actually some key differences between the group, between each survey. For example, the NHANES and NHIS are run by the national government with the National Center of Health Statistics, whereas the BREFIS is run by individual states. So in other words, each individual state creates a BREFIS in order to track specific health outcomes that are important to the states. In terms of the survey medium, um, oftentimes there's differences in these as well. Whereas the NHIST is done completely as an in-person interview where a member of the National Center for Health Statistics comes to your house, the breakfast is done completely by phone, allowing people to easily um, get access to multiple um, people and ultimately increase the sample size. The NHANES is the most intensive out of the three, allowing for both in-person interviews followed by a very comprehensive medical examination. And finally, in terms of health outcome measurement, we can see that even though all three surveys have self-reported health outcomes, the NHANES has an examination, a medical examination by a doctor in order to better account for um, issues with respect to self-report bias. 
And more importantly, because our focus tonight is on Asian American health, um, the sample sizes of Asian individuals within these three surveys are far different. You can see here that about 1,000 people are sampled with respect to NHANES per year, about 2,000 people are sampled with respect to NHIS per year, and of the biggest of the, of the three, the breakfast samples about 13,000 people per year. So even though there has been intentional um, efforts to oversample Asian people, there continues to remain barriers in terms of accessing these data. In public use data, it's often very difficult to access um, data both on Asian individuals, but also disaggregating individuals. So I encourage you to take a look at this um, essay by Ar Arman Jamal and his colleagues to really dive into what is available to the public. Now, knowing that, how can we think about the differences between um, cardiometabolic risks, between our different surveys, but also by race? So I'd like to share one example of this, particularly with respect to heart attack. So what you'll see here on the x-axis is the age and sex adjusted prevalence. So otherwise, the proportion of people in the United States who have heart attack. And here on the y-axis, you see the different health surveys. So the NHIS, BN Haynes, and the breakfast. And in particular, if we focus specifically on Asian individuals, we can see that the range of prevalences goes from as low as 1.5% for the NHIS to as high as 2.3% in the breakfast. In particular, we, what we want to focus on is, are these differences different? If we look and compare between NHIS and NHANES, we can see that with respect to their um, error bars, we can see that there's a general overlap, meaning that, hey, these two surveys are pretty good and, and consistent in terms of their estimate. If we look between the NHANES and the breakfast, however, breakfast, we see that, yes, there's, there is some overlap with respect to the bars, indicating that, in this case, they, there are some consistencies. However, when we compare between the NHIS and the breakfast, we see that the breakfast is systematically higher as compared to the NHIS, indicating that if we compared the prevalence for NHIS versus breakfast, we see, we'll see that it's systematically higher for the breakfast as compared to the NHIS. Now, what I also wanna focus on is disparity. So for example, if we compare um, the prevalence of heart attack between non-Hispanic Asian people and non-Hispanic Black individuals, we can see that within a survey, such as just within NHIS, we can see consistency with respect to where the direction of disparities look. So for NHIS, we could see that Black individuals are higher as compared to Asian individuals. With NHANES, we also see that Black individuals are higher with, in comparison to Asian individuals, as well as the same thing for breakfast. So while there might be systematic differences bet between surveys for a single race group, disparities may not necessarily contrast with respect to certain groups. <laughs> Ultimately, what can we take away from this? Well. Perhaps there might be particular issues in the ways they are sampled. Um, perhaps different Asian ethnic groups might be sampled differently, hence the differences in terms of the prevalence of heart attack. Um, also, in addition to that, because we're using public data, we might not actually know which Asian groups were sampled in this case. But generally, what we can say is that our national data sets are pretty consistent in terms of calculating the prevalence, prevalence for our cardiometabolic disease outcomes. However, there may be some discrepancies with respect to certain health outcomes for certain groups. And as I've shown you before, I've only looked specifically at aggregated Asian groups. So the bigger question we have to ask ourselves and how to expand this work is how consistent are these national estimates among disaggregated Asian groups? So knowing that there's an issue with disaggregation, what we might want to also consider is what are some potential new groups we have to consider in the growth and the change changes of the Asian American population. And here I would like to focus on some work that I've done with electronic health record data for the cardiovascular vascular disease among Asians and Pacific Islander study. Now with respect to multiracial people here in the United States, about one in five Asian people identify as, multi, as multiple races. So for, for example, being Asian and white or Asian and black. However, in comparison for the Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander population, over 50%, nearly 60% of um, Native Hawaiian Pacific Islander people identify as multiple race groups. Now, with respect to our survey data, unfortunately for our public use survey data, it's hard to get um, data on disaggregated age groups. What you're seeing right here is an example of the sample sizes of different race groups within our within the 2018 and HIS. Now, as of 20 um, 2022, we're only able to look at disaggregated age groups up through the 2018 and HIS. 
Well, you can see right here that the sample sizes for these groups are pretty small, about 1,000 people for Asian Indian Filipino and a little less than 1,000 people for Chinese. Japanese and Korean individuals, which comprise the fourth and fifth largest Asian groups, aren't even available in public data. In fact, they're probably grouped in the other Asian group, which accounts for 1,400 individuals. If you're trying to find data on Native Hawaiian people or Pacific Islander people, it's hard to find it in public use data. So the question is, is if I want to study these communities, how can I um, get better access to data? Well, one way we can get better access to data is by collaborating with healthcare systems and using electronic health records, which have thousands upon thousands of individuals of different and multicultural racial backgrounds. In the CASPER um, data set, for example, we can see here that we have a sample of 77,000 Asian Indian individuals. And I don't know about you, but I've never seen a data set with 77,000 Asian Indian individuals. We can see we also have um, high proportion or high sample sizes for Chinese individuals, Filipino people, Japanese, Korean. This is the power of um, electronic health records is that we can look at more people and really get granular. In addition to that, we can also look at um, Pacific Islander groups such as Native Hawaiian people, as well as other Pacific Islanders. Now, unfortunately in this case, we're unable to examine the other Pacific Islander group due to the heterogeneity within that group as well. And with respect to um, multiracial people, if you try to look at the number of multiracial individuals in a national health survey, it's very low in the hundreds, about 421 people identified as multiple races in the 2018 NHIS. And if you try to disaggregate who those multiple race people are, you won't be able to find it, at least in a public use data set. With electronic health records, with the ability to um, see the racial categories that people identify themselves as, we can look at thousands upon thousands of people identify as multiple race groups. You can see here is that we have about 12,000 people who identify as Asian and white. So for example, identifying as Chinese and white, we have 11,000 people who identify as Pacific Islander Asian. So for example, people who identify as Samoan as well as Filipino. And you can see here, we have a little less than 10,000 people who identify as three race groups, ultimately leading to a sample of 41,000 individuals. So now that we, can take a look at these large sample sizes, let's look at what health disparities look like among single race, but more importantly, multiracial groups, where a growing population within the Asian and Pacific honor communities. So first, let's go ahead and look at coronary heart disease, otherwise known as CHD. On the x-axis is the prevalence, so the proportion of people who have coronary heart disease. This black bar right here represents the prevalence or the proportion of non-Hispanic white people who have CHD. Any blue bars to the right of the line represent groups who have high, um, higher coronary heart disease compared to non-Hispanic white people, and any groups to the left of the bar have lower um, coronary heart disease as compared to non-Hispanic white people. If we take a look at the single race Asian groups first, we can see that there's some heterogeneity with these groups. Some groups, such as Asian, Indian, and Filipino, have higher prevalence of CHD compared to non-Hispanic white people. Whereas other groups, such as Chinese, Japanese, and Korean individuals, have lower um, levels of CHD. For the Pacific Islander groups, the single race Pacific Islander groups, rather, we can see that Native Hawaiian and other Pacific Islander groups have a little higher prevalence of um, CHD. However, our focus for tonight is with these other race groups. You can see that overwhelmingly, each multiracial group has a higher prevalence of coronary heart disease in comparison to non Hispanic white people we can see that this proportion is as high as 4.32% among people who identify as Pacific Islander, Asian, and white, and as low as 2.13% among people who identify as Asian and white. With respect to stroke, we see very similar trends um, for multiracial groups. We can see that overwhelmingly Pacific Islander and Asi Asian individuals, Asian and white, and multiple race individuals all have higher prevalence of stroke as compared to the non-Hispanic white population. And more importantly, if we think about other related factors such as obesity, um, we can see that here, um, multiracial groups also have a high prevalence of obesity when we use um, a BMI cutoff at 30 in comparison to the rest of the um, a multiple race groups. This red bar right here represents the proportion of people who are just normal weight among um, um, non-Hispanic white people. But you can see here in the blue bars, which represent different classes of obesity, we can see that they are far bigger as compared to some of the single race Asian groups and also some of the Pacific Islander groups. 
And these trends where there's higher obesity among um, multiracial groups continues to stay persistent even after we count for socioeconomic factors, socioeconomic factors, and health behaviors. So ultimately, what can we take away um, from this? Well, first, it's that electronic health records, in light of the lack of data from national health sur surveys, can provide us with good data to understand not only health of aggregated um, groups, but also disaggregated single race and multiracial Asian and Pacific Islander groups. For our Asian groups, single race Asian groups appear to be healthier with respect to cardiovascular disease and obesity compared to the non-Hispanic white population. However, as the U.S. becomes, becomes more multiracial, we might be missing out on key health disparities for multiracial Asian and Pacific Islander groups, who in this case appear less healthy as compared to non-Hispanic white people. And ultimately, this provides us with some new opportunities to really ask the question, how can we better address the increased risk of cardiometabolic disease among multiracial and Asian Pacific Islander populations? So one way we can think about this is about really contextualizing um, cardiometabolic disease among Asian people, specifically looking at what are those individual level contributors to cardiometabolic disease. So similar to how we think about um, cardiometabolic disease and the heterogeneity that exists within cardiometabolic disease, we know that there's actually a lot of differences with respect to Asian groups based on socioeconomic status. For example, with respect to the in, a percentage of individuals who have a bachelor's degree, about over half of all Asian people have at least a bachelor's degree and above. But we can see here specifically with Filipino people and Vietnamese people, less than half of Filipino people and Vietnamese people have less than a bachelor's degree. For poverty, about one in 10 people of Asian people are li currently living in poverty. Or we could see that it's actually much higher among Chinese individuals compared with other um, Asian ethnic groups. For median household income among Asian groups, it's about 85,000. But we can see that it's much higher among Asian Indian individuals, but also much lower among Vietnamese individuals. And in addition to that, thinking about what factors are important for Asian people, such as living in a multi generational household, about one in four Asian people currently live in a multi-generational household. Well, we can see that it can become much lower among the Japanese individuals, but also much higher among Vietnamese individuals. So knowing that there's these, these differences in socioeconomic outcomes among Asian groups, what we really want to think about is how much do these socioeconomic factors, in addition to other factors, how much do these factors explain the difference in variance um, in cardiovascular health and mortality among Asian groups? and other race groups. So I'd like to frame this discussion first by thinking about a sociological model um, for health. In particular, when we think about health, we're often focused here on the individual level factors, thinking about how our individual level biological factors, our behaviors, our individual physical and built environment, our experiences with the healthcare system and our sociocultural environment ultimately affect health. But it's important for us to acknowledge the fact that um, there are other factors that affect health, which are removed of the of their of their individual experience, such as our interpersonal connections with other people, our communities that we live in, and ultimately the societies and policies that ultimately shape our experiences of health. However, our data are limited. Oftentimes, we focus just on the individual level, which is what I'll focus on tonight in terms of thinking about what is that explained difference in cardiovascular disease as well as mortality among Asian individuals. So first, I'd like to share some work uh, with my colleagues, um, Lady Silviano and Dale McLellan, looking at the amount of explained variants in cardiovascular disease among Asian people. So first, I'd like to kind of focus on these blue bars, specifically demographic factors. In general, among all Asian individuals, demographic factors such as age and sex only explain about 7% of the difference in prevalent cardiovascular disease um, among these groups. But you can see here that there's actually a lot of heterogeneity with respect to groups. You can see for Chinese individuals, it's a little lower at 4%, whereas among Filipino and Asian Indian people, it's much higher around 8% for Filipino people, as well as Asian Indian people. Now, if we think about the confluence of all the outcome, all factors together, we can see that, th yes, as we account for more things such as health behaviors like smoking, like um, uh, physical activity, um, in addition to health conditions such as having comorbid diabetes, um, hypertension, and depression, 
as well as socioeconomic factors such as education attainment, um, experiences with poverty. We could see that in general among all Asian people, it accounts for about 11%, which sounds pretty low. And if you think about it, if we only are accounting for 11% of all explained variants in cardiovascular disease, that means we have another 89% of, of factors that we don't know about. Again, these are only individual level factors, things that we individually experience. So we have a whole 89% that we still need to explain. And again, this, this amount of explained variance differs between groups. It's as low as 9% among Chinese individuals, but as high as 13% among Filipino. We can also think about how individual um, domains of factors also um, influence health, such as focusing for Filipino people. If we look at Filipino people, we could see that demographic factors plus health conditions like diabetes um, and hypertension account for about 11% of the variance um, for Filipino people. However, for Asian Indian people, it seems like the factor that matters the most are health behaviors, such as smoking, sleep, um, and physical activity. Ultimately, what can we say about this? Well, first we can say that individual level factors um, explain a modest proportion of the variance variants in cardiovascular disease among Asian people. Demographic factors such as age and sex um, contribute the most in terms of the greatest explained variants. However, there's ultimately some differences with respect to the contributions of various domains. For example, health conditions contribute more to differences in cardiovascular health among Filipino people, while health behaviors contribute more to Asian Indian people. Ultimately, this is important because as we think for future clinicians and we think about interventions, Perhaps for Filipino people, our focus needs to be on the individual health conditions, such as the higher prevalence of diabetes among Filipino people. Whereas for Asian Indian people, we might want to consider focusing on individual health behaviors, such as sleep or diet and as well. So I also like to expand this work to thinking about how much of this variance explains mortality. So I talked a little bit about prevalence, but now let's talk a little bit about how much it explains for mortality. So with respect to um, mortality, we can we can see here that age alone, just age, accounts for about 38% of differences in mortality of all-cause mortality and about 29% with respect to cardiovascular mortality. Again, a very sizable proportion. And it also kind of makes sense as we think about it as individuals get older, um, they have a higher likelihood of experiencing mortality, but also we have, still have to consider as well is that there's a higher likelihood of having cardiometabolic diseases as well as other outcomes. But again, this isn't to say that getting old is bad, but this is more to say that, you know, how can we support people to age with dignity? Now, if we think about the contribution of additional factors, the thing I want to focus on is specifically the idea of SPURFs, otherwise known as standard modifiable cardiovascular risk factors, such as diabetes, hypertension, high cholesterol, and smoking, in addition to health behaviors, such as diet, exercise, and sleep. You can see here is that age plus these standard modifiable risk factors accounts for about 45% of all cause mortality and about 36% of cardiovascular disease mortality. If we look at just age plus health behaviors, this accounts for about 40, 40.7%, 41% for all cause mortality and about 32% for cardiovascular disease mortality. Now, if we take, think about all of these individual factors, such as demographic factors like sex and race, socioeconomic factors, biological factors such as people's hemoglobin A1C, their cholesterol levels, um, lipoproteins, the medications they take. Ultimately, we're only explaining about half of the difference um, in uh, all-cause mortality and half of the difference in cardiovascular disease mortality. In other words, we still have a whole set of variants that we have left to explain. In other words, there are other factors out there that we can not account for at the individual level that ultimately can influence health in this case. Now, again, while we can't change things like age, we can change things like our health behaviors. So one thing to really think about and focusing on is how health behaviors can improve life expectancy. In this case, um, among people who live in lower um, in income areas versus higher income areas, we can see that the um, effects for smoking actually leads to lower, even far lower um, life expectancy for people who live in low income areas versus people who live in high income areas. But again, not smoking will lead to improvements in both groups. With respect to obesity, we can see that it's much worse among 
people living in low income communities versus high income communities. And exercise um, it seems to have a very strong effect as well. Ultimately, what can we really say about um, the explained variants or what factors contribute to our health in cardiometabolic health? Well, first of all, we could say that age alone explains nearly one third of the variance and the difference in all cause and cardiovascular disease mortality. Ultimately, this mortality can also be improved by modifying on different health factors. And finally, about 50% of all of the variants in all cause mortality and cardiovascular disease mortality can really be explained by these individual level demographic, socioeconomic, health behavior, and health outcomes. This ultimately leads me back to this model. Again, we've talked about 50% of all mortality. 50% of all mortality can be accounted for by these individual levels. So you're probably asking, where does the other 50% come from? Well, the other 50%, I hypothesize, really comes from the confluence of different interpersonal factors, community level factors, and society level factors that ultimately underlie differences in cardiometabolic health. So finally, I want to leave us with talking about some discussions about predicting cardiometabolic health, um, the third part of the talk, and thinking about pathways to move forward. So as of November 2023, there is a new cardiovascular disease risk prediction equation um, with respect to um, health, otherwise known as the predicting risk of cardiovascular disease events, the prevent online calculator. Now, this website actually went live, I believe, actually on Monday. Um, so I provide a little bit of a, of a link here if you want to take a look or a screenshot. But what you can do is you can go ahead and head to the website and really take a look at um, people's cardiometabolic risk. Now, again, this calculator is meant for individuals who don't have pre-existing heart disease, but it's interesting to kind of see where our new focus is. Now, prior to focusing on prevents, our old way of doing things was with the the pool cohort equations, which included a lot of the same factors, but also included ish, um, um, race. And with respect to, to race, the pool cohort equations had a separate equation for um, black individuals and a separate equation for white individuals. And that really begged the question, well, how do Asian people do this? Well, some previous work by Fatima Rodriguez found that with respect to Asian individuals, as well as Hispanic individuals, the pool cord equations tended to overestimate um, the risk among these groups. In other words, it wasn't consistent across and it wasn't calibrated. So the prevent equations themselves were created in order to address these issues of overcalibration and undercalibration by including a sample of 6 million people um, in order to create these equations. Now you can see here on this slide, the differences between the pool cohort equations, which people have been using um, prior to November 2023, and the new AHA prevent equations. You can see here in red is that with the prevent equations, we use new factors in order to predict the risk of cardiovascular disease, such as glomerular filtration rate, which is a measure of um, people's kidney function, whether or not individuals use statin, um, body mass index, urinary albumin to creatinine ratio, hemoglobin A1C, again, a marker of diabetes, and ultimately, to get rid of this idea of biological essentialism and using race um, as a key factor that predicts um, cardiovascular disease, we're trying to think about more importantly the social factors that ultimately um, differences in cardiovascular disease by race, such as using the area level deprivation index. Now, you're probably wondering okay, so we've got rid of race in the AHA prevent equations, but how well does it perform across race? Well, some current work by um, Sadia Khan and her colleagues looked at the validation of the prevent equations by race, particularly among 3 million of those, 600, of those 6 million individuals in this case. So what you can see here is we can see the calibration stuff. So what I want you to focus on is how close are these numbers are to one. The closer the number is to one, the better the calibration, the better the equation performs. In particular, if we look at white individuals, we can see here that these numbers are very close to one. So the equations themselves perform very well among white individuals. Among Hispanic individuals, they also perform pretty well. Again, very close to one with their um, uh, kind of range, including one as well. However, and unfortunately, among Asian individuals, the equations don't perform so well. In this case, we see that we see we see that their calibration slopes are lower than. In other words, what this is indicating to us is that since it's less than one, what happens is that it's actually over predicting the burden of cardiovascular disease among Asian people. 
In other words, we're, we're, the equation is predicting that there are more Asian people with cardiovascular disease than there are. So ultimately, that really begs the question as to, well, what do we do next? Well, ultimately, what my work is going to focus on next is looking at the um, at how prevent um, performs among not only aggregated Asian groups, but also disaggregated Asian groups and multiracial groups. What you're seeing right here on your screen is the differences in the um, risk of cardiovascular disease based on the pool coordination. What you can see right here among multiracial groups specifically, among individuals at the higher risk category, which is a 10% risk within 10 years of having a cardiovascular event, we can see that's particularly high among multiracial groups. Again, this really begs the question as to what can we do in order to um, improve the health of Asian and Pacific Islander communities? So ultimately, these next steps will be to evaluate the performance of prevent among Asian Pacific Islander groups. In addition to this, my AHA postdoctoral fellowship will think about how do we better incorporate social determinants of health and predicting cardiovascular risk. And also, I hope to expand this work to look at type 2 diabetes and ultimately to create and develop and modify current and existing clinical algorithms to better predict cardiometabolic disease by incorporating both clinical and social data. So with this, I wanna leave you with some final key takeaways. First, multiracial Asian and Pacific Islander groups experience increased risk of cardiovascular disease and obesity when compared to single race, Asian and non-Hispanic groups. Second, social and health factors have a meaningful contribution in explaining the burden of cardiometabolic disease among Asian groups. And finally, as the Asian and Pacific Islander populations diversify, there's a need um, for new prediction models to account for these diversifying populations. And with that, let me leave you with three calls to action. What can we do to improve Asian and Pacific Islander health? The first thing I want to emphasize is the importance of advocacy. Again, there is no story if there are no data. So I really want to call upon you all to advocate with your legislators to more intentionally collect data on disaggregated Asian Pacific Islander groups, but also make these data um, available for public use. Armand Jamal and his colleagues really highlighted some of these issues with respect to the availability of um, public use data, especially with respect to um, the different racial and ethnic groups. In addition to that, I want our stories to be known. So I wanna encourage you all to participate in clinical trials to increase the representation of Asian Pacific Islander people, especially those from less represented groups. Now, in particularly here at Stanford, we have a new cohort called the ARISE cohort, which aims to enroll 2,100 Asian Pacific Islander individuals in order to better understand the cardiovascular health among Asian and Pacific Islander people. This is gonna, going to be part of a 10,000 person cohort, essentially very similar to the Framingham Heart Study to ultimately understand the individual and social factors that ultimately lead to differences in cardiovascular disease health. Now, if you're not here at Stanford, I wanna encourage you to look at other recruitment sites such as the University of Washington, University of Hawaii, and New York University as well. And finally, let's initiate and maintain health habits such as exercise, healthy eating, and um, lack of smoking and tobacco. Ultimately thinking about these individual factors that we can intervene on, the 50%, and ultimately advocating for the other 50%. And with that, I'd like to give some special thanks to my mentors, both past and present, Dr. Lata Palavinapan, Dr. Stephen Corbin, Dr. Fatima Rodriguez. Also shout outs to my past mentors, Dr. Gilbert G and Dr. Christine Pollub, to my collaborators, colleagues, and students who have all supported me in this work, to the Center for Asian Health Research and Education, for the faculty and staff, and finally to my family and my friends whose stories inspire and motivate my work. And with that, let's go ahead and take any questions. Great. Um Dr. Bakong, thank you so much. That was just a really rousing call to action after just a phenomenal review of uh, the state of the science for cardiometabolic disease uh, for Asians and non-Asians. It really reminds us that data is uh, king and uh, that we need to be very sophisticated when we take a look at some of the data and the recommendations are coming out. I mean, uh, uh, the average person, if they got a recommendation from the American Heart Association saying this is your cardiometabolic risk, most people would say, wow, that's my risk. But what you're suggesting is that 
these equations need to really account for um, uh, for ethnicity and for race and for other factors until we can get a model that can take into account that other 50% of things that we're not measuring right now and kind of thinking about this idea of nature versus nurture. Um, I, I did have a comment, for, a question for you. So we've got several questions from the audience. And one of the questions is so, some people were unfamiliar with the term cardiometabolic. I know you talked a little bit about that earlier, but can you tell us what you mean by cardiometabolic disease? Yes, of course. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasan. So normally when we think about these different disease categories, we're often focused on different um, uh, organ systems, such as the cardiovascular system. We think about the endocrine system. But cardiometabolic disease is really a new, um, a fairly new term um, used in lay audiences to really focus on the confluence of diseases together. Oftentimes we see individuals with heart disease um, having things like fatty liver disease in addition to diabetes. These diseases aren't necessarily separate from each other, but they ultimately work together in terms of affecting individuals. So cardiometabolic diseases refers to a set of diseases such as heart disease, stroke, um, and diabetes, which often work in concert together um, to affect health. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's it's thought that there are from differences in the way that fatty acids uh, or free fatty acids are really metabolized and made. And uh, as you mentioned, they include things like strokes and heart attacks, but also increased blood pressure, problems with cholesterol and insulin resistant uh, glucose metabolism. So that, that's terrific. Um, you know, I see a lot of patients in my clinic and uh, who are Asian. And they all have a lot of the same questions. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, a lot of them have to do with things that they can do to modify their diet, uh, to become a little bit more healthy. Uh, you'd mentioned this earlier as one of your calls to action. Can you give people maybe a few concrete recommendations about what they can do to reduce their cardiovascular and cardiometabolic disease risk? Yes, of course. I think the first thing to kind of think about is first meeting people where they're at. So, Again, we're not asking people to go out and run a marathon. We're not asking people to go out and lift you know, 100 kilograms. What we're asking them to do is to start to make small little changes. We see that um, individual level health factors related to smoking, related to um, diet, ultimately have a large effect on health. So with respect to diet, you know, thinking about small proportions, thinking about um, alternatives in, in terms of um, what you would use. So maybe just a little bit less salt or considering other um, small little changes you can do. Again, we think that small little changes won't necessarily make a difference, but it's the addition of small changes over time that can ultimately um, influence health um, as well. With respect to things like exercise, the diet, in addition to sleep, I think sleep is always a very important thing. And I think there's a, a renewed focus on making sure that people get enough sleep um, to rest and relax as well. <laughs> Absolutely right. That's become one of the new American Heart Association's uh, eight life steps. So I think that was just added in 2022 uh, to be able to be uh, a, a new cardiometabolic uh, risk factor. So I'm so glad you mentioned sleep. That's terrific. Um, we have another question from the audience uh, asking about uh, Ozempic. And uh, I, I know this is a little bit outside of the scope of your talk, but I was wondering if you were aware of any of the data about Ozempic, and uh, uh, which is a medication that's been used to treat diabetes. Uh, it's of a class of medications called GLP-1 inhibitors. Um, and the generic name for, for the one Ozempic is uh, um, semaglutide. And there's also another four or five medications in that class. Um, any thoughts or comments about uh, how that might affect cardiometabolic disease? Yes. So in terms of um, Ozempic, I know that there was recently actually at the American Heart Association in November, they released data about um, the SELECT trial, essentially finding that among individuals with diabetes who take Ozempic, they actually had lower um, events of cardio cardiovascular disease as compared to people who didn't take or who didn't have Ozempic. Now, again, I know Zepic is a very expensive medication. It also involves um, injections. Now, if you can afford that, that is wonderful. But I think in terms of Ozempic, I think don't think of Ozempic as just um, the only thing you need to do in terms of improving your cardiovascular health, especially for people with diabetes. You need to think about, um, one, what does your uh, physician recommend? But two, um, medications are important, but it's also important to incorporate um, uh, changes to your lifestyle. So. So the ability that you can, you know, walking more, exercising more, um, having a, a more um, 
uh, diabetic-free diet, in addition to reducing things like uh, fatty acids, um, salt intake, everything like that, which ultimately can influence obesity as well. So even though it's a quote-unquote anti-obesity drug, um, yes, you know, medications are important, but we also have to consider the fact that um, individual level choices can also matter as well in terms of improving um, obesity too. Oh, it's such good advice, Dr. Bakong. Uh, I know there was another study that had looked also at uh, the uh, reduction in cardiovascular risk and cardiometabolic risk for people who uh, were obese without diabetes and showed something very similar. So it's good to know uh, all of your tips that you have. Um, you know, we have a question from the audience that, uh, let me just go over to that particular question, that asks uh, something that really struck me also when you were presenting, which was that multiracial groups appear to have more cardiovascular risk factors and uh, worse cardiovascular outcomes than uh, uh, single race uh, groups, whether it's um, uh, Asian or Hispanic or uh, uh, Caucasian, non-Hispanic, white. Uh, do you have any comments or thoughts on why that might be? Yes, I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done among the multiracial groups. I think in particular, because this is a growing population, um, we need to consider, you know, essentially what is like the demographic profile of multiracial people in the United States, especially as it grows. I think if we kind of think about it from traditional individual level risk factors, perhaps we could consider things such as um, differences in diet, for example. So oftentimes people in these single race groups um, are often immigrant groups. People who might identify as multiple, multiple races might be you know, second generation, third generation individuals. I think we also have to kind of think about um, other social factors such as discrimination as something that affects these groups. Oftentimes some of the um, discrimination literature has shown that racial discrimination, for example, or racism, can affect individuals, especially individuals who don't necessarily identify as one group. Um, and then in addition to that, I think it's, what we're really showing right here is a new, uh, not necessarily new, but a, an invisibilized group who we don't necessarily think about as much, but yet they're very much a significant por proportion of our population for Asian people. 4.1 million Asian individuals identify as multiple races. So we have to think about how not only individual level factors, but also social and structural factors um, affect the experiences of multiracial individuals here in the United States. That's so important. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really impressed with how you've given us a, a model and a system to be able to think about the contributions, both nature, nurture, environment, all of those things together, and how our health behaviors can uh, really affect our risk. I was struck by your 11% of uh, cardiovascular risk can be attributed just by some of the individual factors alone. And when you kind of put that uh, the first box together that you'd shown, it only accounts for half of the cardiovascular risk. Uh, we have a couple more questions here, uh, if you're comfortable answering these, on the choice of exercise that uh, can reduce cardiovascular risk and whether weight bearing might be more effective than cardio and uh, uh, really thinking about which types of exercise to focus on. Yes, of course. So at least with respect to should I focus on uh, cardio versus should I focus on weightlifting? Um, there's actually some really good evidence with at least with respect to um, people who identify as Asian individuals. And this is actually some work done by my mentor, Dr. Lata Palanyapan, who, who has shown that with respect to Asian individuals, um, actually it's the weight bearing exercise that can really, really help um, with respect to reducing hemoglobin A1C over time. Um, I can't remember the exact name of the uh, of the study, but in a randomized controlled I trial, strong, I think it's a strong D study. Strong D, there you go. Thank you so much, Dr. Srinivasan. In the strong D study, they've shown that at least for um, some Asian individuals, doing um, weight training actually helped improve um, hemoglobin A1C. So again, this is not to say you should only do weight training; you should only do uh, 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 cardio, but what you should really focus on is having a good moderation of both weight training and cardio in terms of what works for you. And again, some people can't do weight training, some people can't do cardio, but you want to try your best in terms of incorporating what you can to the best of your ability, especially for these individual level health behaviors. Wonderful. Um, Dr. Bakong, I know we're close to time. Do you have time for one more question? Yeah, of course. Happy to answer another question. So we have uh, one of our uh, attendees who has a question about uh, the AHA Prevent. 
uh, and asks about why zip code has been included uh, in the prevent model, or at least one of the prevent models. Yeah, of course. So with respect to the prevent models, if you go to the American Heart Association website, um, you'll see that they have the base AHA prevent model. So the reason for this is that depending on where you live, um, or depending on you know, the availability of data or what you know from your own medical records, um, you can input certain things. Now, there, there are going to be expansions on the website to include some of these other labs, which you may or may not do with your doctor or your physician. But with respect to um, area level deprivation index, um, previous work in the social epidemiology space has found that um, where you live really matters. Um, so where you live with respect to the levels of um, healthy food environments, where you live with respect to walkability, um, where you live with respect to the socioeconomic um, uh, composition of your neighborhood, ultimately can have an influence on your individual level of health behaviors. So in light of not being able to account for individual level of health behaviors, what we can do is think about um, where you live as a proxy as to how your environment influences your choices for health. So the reason for including area level deprivation index is that it's a really good indicator, although not perfect, of how your environment can ultimately affect your decisions for um, your health care or your health behaviors. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dr. Bakong. Um, I'm sure on behalf of the, our entire audience, I'd like to give you a warm round of applause. And also thank you to our audience for coming and participating in the Stanford Care Community Health Talks tonight. I hope you found this as informative and empowering as I did. I'm going to be sure to really think about nature versus nurture and think about my behaviors and uh, all of those other interactional factors that Dr. Bakong has so nicely laid out. Our next community health talk will be on February 13th at 7 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. And our topic discussion will be with Dr. Jeffrey Velota, who will speak on lung cancer screening incidents and outcomes amongst Asian Americans. And uh, the registration link has been placed in the uh, chat uh, by Nina Lee. Thank you again to Nina. So a big shout out to Stanford Care, to Dr. Bakong, Kevin Morrison, um, uh, and of course, our wonderful Nina Lee, who is our coordinator for all of these. So uh, please, again, join me in thanking uh, all, of, uh, all of these amazing collaborators. And a big thanks to you for taking time to inform yourself about how you can lead a more healthy, happy, and satisfying life. Thank you, everyone, and take care.